I've got two messages that the Lord put on my heart. And so I was talking with Bobby about it. He said, preach one, have an intermission, and then come back and preach the other one. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to preach one of them, and if it's not the right one, then I'll preach the other one. So this is called Faith for the Mighty Works. Faith for the Mighty Works. Mark 6, 1 through 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? Where is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Well, I was, I was reading this passage. I was struck once again in how the unbelief of the village was highlighted in this text as being the reason that no mighty work was done. The Greek word for faith in the Bible is the word pistis. That, that's important because in this text, the word for unbelief is the word apistis. Kind of, we do that the same in the English language. We have the word gnostic, which means or, uh, knowledge, and then we have an agnostic, which means without knowledge. So by putting that word a there, you're making it the opposite. So in a sense, unbelief is anti-faith or against faith or without faith. That's important because we can deduce then that the reason for no mighty miracles being done in this village is because there was no faith on the part of the village. Now, there was no belief in what Jesus and what he could do. You see, we need to understand that faith is the key to seeing the manifestation of God's will on the earth. And the Bible teaches us that. We're not going to teach this whole message on faith and why faith is important, but we're going to just give you a few uh, uh, things to remind you of what we've talked about. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance or the substance of things hoped for and the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it's impossible to please him, God, for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists. And the only way you can know the existence of God is by faith. You can look at things that point towards God, but there's no scientific proof that God exists. But God reveals himself to us. God doesn't try to prove himself. He just reveals to us. He tells us in the beginning God. He doesn't try to give us a scientific understanding or reasoning of why he exists. He just says, I am. In fact, that's what he says. I am that I am. And that's all you need to know. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to, uh, to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek after him. I like to say, and I learned this from a guy named Miles Monroe, where he learned it from, I don't know, that faith is the currency of the kingdom. Without money, without currency, one cannot do anything in this world. In the United States, the currency that we use is dollars. If you go down to Bolivia, it's bolivares. If you go down to Mexico, it's pesos. If you go up to Canada, I'm not sure what they use up there. But in, in, uh, in London, they use pounds, right? So you have to have money, whatever your currency is, in this world in order to do something because the world runs on money. I've had uh, two houses that I've been involved in in uh, uh, seeing their, um, uh, their re, what do you call that? <laughs> uh, renovations, that's it, seeing their renovations. Uh, the first one was my house when it went through the flood and that house just sat there until I finally got a loan from SBA. And it was amazing. Once I got money, everything started working. You got money? Yes. Okay, how, how, here's what I'm going to do. Boom, 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 boom. No money, and your house is going to sit. And then we have this house up here in the front that we're working on. We're renovating that house as well for the church. And once we got the loan for the, for the church, then all of a sudden, man, we started seeing some stuff happen over there. Boom, boom, boom. Why? Because money is the currency of the kingdom. No money, no action. Well, I mean a currency of the world. But in the, in the kingdom, the currency is faith. 
You cannot receive, you cannot uh, uh, press into, you cannot please God without faith. Faith is therefore, in a sense, the currency of the kingdom. Everything in the kingdom runs on faith. If we go back to the previous chapter in Mark, going back to the previous chapter in our text, we see faith and evidence to such an extent that it surprised Jesus. In Mark 5, 25-34, there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years who suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said, if I, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And the Bible says, immediately the flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see uh, who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Daughter, your faith has made you well. It was faith that made this woman whole. It was faith, and this is important, it wasn't Jesus' faith. It was this woman's faith. He said, woman, your faith has made you well. Her faith was the catalyst for her healing. Now, getting back to our text, even though there was no faith in the crowd, there was no faith in the village, that doesn't mean that there wasn't faith. Jesus himself had faith. Getting back to our text, it says in verse 5, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. That tells me that what the text was emphasizing is not the lack of faith entirely, but the lack of faith in the crowd, the lack of faith in his hometown, Nazareth. There was faith present. How do I know that? Because there was some sick people being healed. It could be that some of these sick people had faith to be healed, but more than likely, it was Jesus that had faith to be able to do something in the midst of that crowd. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute, Jesus was the Son of God. He didn't need faith. Well, I want you to know that even though Jesus was the Son of God, Philippians chapter 2 says that he left his deity aside. Everything he did on this planet, he did by faith. He did as a man of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, believing God just like you and I. Now, he may have heard and saw God, his Father, more clearly than we do because we've been tainted in the past by sin. We have unbelief flowing through, our, through the way that we think many times. That's why we come to church to hear the Word of God because we're not supposed to be conformed to the way that we used to think, conformed to the world, but we're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Well, maybe Jesus didn't have to go through that, but he did work just like you and I. How Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and power and he went around doing good healing all those that were oppressed of the enemy because God was with him he moved in the same way that you and I are are encouraged to move through the Bible all right so Jesus had faith and in fact there are some examples of Jesus's faith being the catalyst for the miracles that were done and they'll become very evident to you because in both of these examples the people that were involved had no faith and you'll see why Luke chapter 7, 11 through 15. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the bier and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Now I want you to know that Jesus was moving by faith. That wasn't something that he did. He, he said, well, how do you know? Well, another text that says in John, I believe it's John 5, 19 or 12, 49. It says, the works that I, uh, he says, uh, I said what I heard my father saying. In another text, he said, I do what I see my father doing. 
right? We walk by faith, not by sight. So he's perceiving, he's hearing, he's getting an understanding of what the will of the Father is, what the Father is wanting to do. He doesn't know in the sense that a mail has been delivered to him telling him what he's exactly supposed to do, but he's perceiving the will of the Father. And as he perceives the will of the Father by faith, he begins to move and do what he perceives that the Father wants to do. Faith without works is dead. In other words, faith is uh, manifested in the presence of what we do. You say you have faith without works. I say, uh, let me show you my faith by what I do. So Jesus moved up, and it's obvious that the man that was in the, in the casket had no faith. The people in the crowd weren't shining evidences of faith. The people that were with Jesus had no clue what he was going to do. So who was it that had faith? Jesus had faith. And because of that, this man was raised from the dead. And another example, most of you all know this, John 11, 38 through 44. Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. We're talking about Lazarus. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. No faith. Right? Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Now, what did he say? If you believe, Jesus himself was believing, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now, Lazarus didn't have faith. The sisters didn't have faith. The crowd didn't have faith. Who was it that had faith? Jesus had faith. It was Jesus and Jesus alone following the will of his father who acted in faith and saw in both scenarios the dead come to life. I share with you these scriptures so that you can see that Jesus was, was uh, what Jesus was seeing, but he, w- he wasn't seeing just in the natural realm. He was seeing in the spiritual realm. He saw what his father was doing. He proceeded to do what his father was doing. He was walking by faith, not by sight. So faith, as we said before, is the currency of the kingdom. In Nazareth, we know that the crowd didn't have faith, But what I'm trying to show you is that perhaps Jesus himself had faith. There were other instances, as we saw with the woman that we just shared with you before who had the issue of blood, where Jesus didn't have faith, but it was the individual who had faith. But in every case, what you're going to see that it was faith that was important to see the manifestation of the will of God on the planet. Am I making sense to you? Okay, the, in the second scenario, I want you to see is that there are cases where it's the individual that has faith. We've already seen in the woman who had the issue of blood, it was her faith. Well, just like the woman, we have a few other examples in the Bible where it was the faith of the people themselves who came to Jesus, which was the catalyst for their healing. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 14, the Bible says, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, uh, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my root, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority. So what you're going to see in this is that he is, he is perceiving what he sees in Jesus through what he has seen in his own life. So he's seeing more than beyond his own life. He's seeing spiritually what's happening and taking place in Jesus' life. He says, Lord, I too uh, am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. In another place he said, seen such great faith faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because even though they're part of Israel, they have no faith. 
and a centurion who was not part of the Israelite people. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't circumcised. But Jesus said to him, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Why? Because he believed. He had faith. It was his faith that was rewarded. Jesus marveled that he had such great faith. And that's important for us to understand. In Matthew 9, verse 27 through 31, it says that Jesus passed on from there. Two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind man came to him. And Jesus said, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. But I want to give you the full picture because sometimes when you read the text, you don't understand what's happening. The Bible says that two blind men were following him. Think about that. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Do I need to explain this to you? Two blind men who cannot see, therefore they have a difficult time navigating through life, much less following Jesus in a crowd. But even another text, it says they cried out to him and he didn't turn around or he didn't pay attention to them or the disciples said, why don't you just ask him to go away? Why? Because Jesus didn't immediately turn around. He kept right on walking. We don't know how long he walked. Maybe he was outside the town and he had to walk somewhere in the midst of town. Maybe he was two miles away. Maybe he was 10 kilometers kilometers away. Maybe he was right around the corner. I don't know. All I know is that, this, that the blind man who had a hard time seeing, who couldn't see at all, and imagine having to walk and follow Jesus, they kept following after him. And when he turned around, guess who was there? The blind man. And he says, do you believe? Well, they've already demonstrated that they must believe something could happen. And they said, yes, Lord. He touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned, sternly warned them, see that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout the district. Now I want to move into the third thing that I really want to focus on here today. And that's the crowd's faith. In our text then, there was faith present. Could have been the individual's faith. More than likely it was Jesus' faith. But there wasn't a lot of faith. There was only enough. The text itself says there was no mighty miracle able to be done there except that a few sick people got their hands laid on and they were healed. So there was enough faith for a few sick people to be healed, but not enough to do a mighty work. I contend that the faith of the crowd can either hinder the mighty works of God or it can facilitate the mighty works of God. Turn to somebody and say, you're part of the crowd. I contend that the faith of the body, the faith of the crowd, the faith of the people of God gathered together has everything to do with whether we see the mighty miracles of God being done or not. This text teaches us that. Can a, can a work be done without the crowd? Yes, we've already seen that. A work can be done just because God wants to do a work. He can do a work through an individual, just like Jesus did a work. A work can be done because there are individuals who have faith to believe God's word. Works can be done. But what this text teaches us is that a great and mighty work needs and actually is facilitated by the faith of the crowd. When the crowd is on board, when the crowd begins to believe, when the people of God come together and begin to contend, and believe God for the mighty works of God, I contend that's when the mighty works are released in the midst of the, of the people of God and in the midst of the place where they're at. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 16, I'm going to show you that what I'm uh, gleaning from this one particular text has a witness. The Bible says, let it be confirmed with the testimony of two or three witnesses. There are other places in the Bible, I believe, will confirm what I'm sharing with you. In Acts chapter 5, verse 12 through 16, it says, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest there joined them, but the people held them in high esteem. So what is that telling to us? See, what had just happened is, is um, I think, is this where Ananias and Sapphira had just been uh, dealt with. They had lied, 
in church. Uh, they had lied before the apostles, and God dealt with that in a very significant fashion. Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead in the middle of the congregation. Lest you think that Peter was on board with this, you've got to remember that Peter was probably the biggest liar in the Bible. He denied Jesus three times. So I don't think Peter was actually wanting to go after liars. This was just a work of the Holy Spirit. And Peter, I think, was just as surprised as everybody else. But for some reason, God decided that he needed to step in and he needed to deal with this. So because of this, people were kind of afraid to join the church. Well, I, I told somebody I, I like them and I really don't. I don't want to die. Um, you know, I told, I told my wife she looked good in that dress and, you know, I was kind of telling a fib. I don't want to die. <laughs> you know, I... Uh, you know, I, I paid my tithe, but I didn't pay my whole tithe. I don't, I don't want to die. So, you know, what I'm saying is that people were kind of a little wary about joining the church if they weren't all in, like Anna Jo said this morning. I'm most of the way in, I'm some of the way in, but I'm not all in. But I'm, if I'm not all in, I'm kind of afraid what's going to happen to me. So the people uh, did not dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem. But that doesn't mean that people didn't join them. The Bible says, curse were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. So it's not that the church wasn't growing, it's just that it wasn't growing with people that were half-hearted. It was people that had counted the cost. Jesus said, he that would come after me must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow after me. These people had, over, had, had dealt with that. They'd counted the cost. I, I would contend that it's the very people it's talking about in Revelation 12 and 11. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony because they did not count their lives as... Uh, they, they, what is this? Huh? They loved not their lives even to the point of death. They were all in. So there was a lot of believers that were joining. They said, well, well, I'm a believer, but we have to make a distinction. Okay. See, what happens is uh, there are two ways of using the word believer. Believer can be a designation. You're a believer. I'm a believer. Like every time I walk in, he says, I'm Brother Bobby. I said, everybody in this church is brother. <laughs> Everybody's first name is brother. That means you've got to be a brother to join this church. It's just a designation. He's not really my brother, but he's my brother in the Lord. Amen. Right? We can be Christians and not be all in. Christian is a designation. It's a, it's a name that we give to people that choose to follow after Christ. But the word believer can also be used in that way. I'm a believer. I go to a church. I believe in Christ. But this word believer in this text is more than just a designation. It is a verb. It is something that they were doing. That's my contention. They weren't just believers in name. They were believers because of what they were doing. They were believers. They were all in. Believers were added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women. Why, why do I say that? Because the text says, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all Heal. Why do I say they were believers in action and not just in name? Because I want you to know that it takes faith to go get somebody that is not hurt, that's on a mat, that's on a that's that's a paralytic that can't move, that can't walk. It takes faith to get yourself to a place where you're going to go out of your way and expend an effort to know that I may just somehow get them in a place where Peter's shadow is might be able to get on them. They were demonstrating faith. Faith, not just by what they said, but by what they did. You ever had somebody call you that was needy? Yeah? I mean, I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm a Christian, I want to help you. But then they call you again tomorrow. And they call you again the next day. And they call you, and after a while you're like, man, these people sure need a lot. You know, I didn't sign up for this, you know. Imagine having to uh, go get someone when there was no EMS, there were no ambulances. Think of the guy that was a paralytic that the four men were getting him to Jesus and there was no room in the, uh, for them to get through the doorway. So they actually took this man up on a roof and began to tear away the tiles so they can get him in front of Jesus. 
That's what we're talking about. That's what these people were doing. It doesn't say they went next door. It says they went all around the towns around Jerusalem and they were looking for people that were afflicted. They were looking for people that were paralyzed. They were looking for people that were lame, that were deaf, that were blind. And they gathered them up and brought them to the temple where Peter's shadow might, where Peter might be walking God and so that maybe his shadow might just fall upon them. And when it did, see what they were doing, they were demonstrating faith. This wasn't one person. This wasn't just a couple of people. It wasn't the apostles. It was the multitudes. It was believers. They got a hold of what God can do, what God would do, what God was doing, and they got a hold of it. And it moved them by faith to be, participate, to get involved. And what happened? Because it was the believers. It wasn't just one or two. It wasn't just the preacher. It wasn't just one or two individuals that were, you know, had a lot of faith. But it was the whole congregation the multitudes of believers that were joining they said God is in this we can do this let's go get people why? so that they might be healed and what does it say? they brought the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits and they were some of them were healed most of them were healed all healed why? because it was the faith of the multitude. Am I making sense to you? I'm sorry. I get a little excited when I talk about this stuff. I'll try to match your demeanor. Some of you are like. <laughs> the word believers was a verb more than it was a noun. The people that were being added to the church were believing as a group the promises of God. There was faith in the crowd. It was evident by the deeds that they were doing. They were going to get sick people and putting them in Peter's path that they would be healed. And they were. Why? Because the crowd was believing. The multitudes were believing. And mighty works were being done. Even to the point that Peter's shadow was healing people whenever they, he passed by. Isn't that amazing? How many of you all want to see that happen? It's going to take more than just the staff. It's going to take just more than just the worship team. We all have a part to play in it. Every one of us is important. Believing God for what He can do. And I want you to know that I believe that you believe. But I want you to see how important it is that we all believe. Let me give you one more text. Proof what I'm telling to you. And then we'll be done. Acts chapter 19 verse 8 through 12. The Bible says, and Paul entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning, this is when he went to Ephesus, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him. No, notice, he didn't take the converts. You know, there's a difference between a convert and a disciple. A disciple is one who is all in. He that would come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. A convert is somebody who is somewhat of the way in. But he's not all in. Why do you hear my words and do not do them? Whenever we're, you know, you can be a Christian and still be the Lord of your own life. But that's what it means to be a Christian uh, the way we define it. But it's not the way that Jesus defined being a Christian. Jesus defined being a Christian as this way. He said, you don't ask God into your life, you give your life to him. Amen. Paul said, uh, you know, it is uh, uh, Galatians 2 and 20. I'll get it here in a minute. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ in me. In the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Another way of translating, I've already quoted three times, but another way of translating this verse, he that would come after me must deny his right to self-rule. In other words, I don't get to determine what's right and wrong. I don't get to determine what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. I mean, I can by free will, but if I'm going to be a follower of Christ, it's him and him alone. It's what he says and what he says alone. Now, if I choose to do something that's not what he says, I have the freedom to do that. And listen, we all do that. We all mess up. But when we do that, we can't say, that's right. 
we have to recognize it's not right. It's not his way. If the word of God says we're supposed to do something and we choose not to do it, you're free to do that. Please don't misunderstand me. I am no way taking away your freedom to, 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 to choose. You're free not to do what the word of God says. You're free not to give. You're free not to love. You're free to hold up. You have to recognize that it's wrong. And there's a lot of Christians today that are going around saying that the behaviors that they're doing are okay. Why? Because I choose so. Well, you can choose to do it, but you cannot choose for it to be okay if God said it was contrary. His word is right. We're not supposed to conform God to our way of thinking. We're supposed to be conformed to his way of thinking. Right? God's ways are not our ways. We're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So anyway, let's get back. So for three months, he spoke boldly, uh, but then he had to withdraw. So in verse 10, this continued for, uh, he, he reasoned, he took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard of the word, both Jews and Greeks. So this is important for what I'm going to share with you. All of Asia heard the word. So what was happening? Paul was teaching his disciples for a couple of hours during the middle of the day. But that's not all that was happening. What would happen is that after they huddle, anybody watch the games yesterday, the football games? You know what they do? They all get together in a little huddle and they say, okay, you're going to go this way and you're going to go this way. But they just, they just narrow it down to one play. P1774. Okay, I know what I'm supposed to do. And once they decide what they're going to do, what do they do? They say, break. And they go run the play. Do you know that church is supposed to be a huddle where we come together to uh, get on the same page, to build one another's faith, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to believe God together. But then we're not supposed to leave and just hide out in our houses. We're supposed to say break and go run the place. Go out there and do them. So what was happening is they'd meet together in the school of Tyrannus, and Paul would teach them for a couple hours. And then I just imagined saying, okay, Paul says, all right, that's the play. Now break. And then they would all scatter throughout Asia, and they would all begin to teach what Paul had been teaching them. They would all begin to share what Paul had been sharing with them. They would all begin to testify about what was happening in their midst to such an extent. See, everybody was involved. To such an extent that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Not just from Paul. Everyone was involved. And what happens when you hear the word of God? Romans, uh, I think it's Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So what was building? Faith among the disciples, among the crowds. People were hearing of what was happening. And this continued for two years. And it says in verse 11, and, and God, it did just happen miraculously. You have to see the background. You see what was taking place. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. So what I want you to see is the context here. It wasn't just Paul. It was that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It was that faith was growing. And there had to be people that said, Paul, I got somebody in this other place. They need a handkerchief. Can you give me something for me? Okay, here, take it. It wasn't Paul coming up with some way to raise funds. It was people recognizing that there is something happening here. And you know, when I get close to you, something's happened. I wonder if I take a hand and somebody goes and it happens. And then all of a sudden people begin to have faith. You know what? I can do that too. Give me something. And I can imagine Paul wearing his only good, you know, he just went to Dillard's and bought this nice coat and, and they're cutting up into all these little pieces and he's kind of happy, but he's not so happy about it. My coat. But then he gets the reports. So-and-so was delivered from demons. So-and-so over there had a migraines all their life, and they were healed. By the way, I think there may be somebody here. You've been struggling with migraines all your life. God wants to heal you this morning. So-and-so over here, they were struggling with something over there. You know, and I went and laid a hands, and the report's coming back, and Paul's thinking to himself, I need to go buy another coat. What was happening? What I want you to see is we tend to think it was just Paul. No, it was the community. It says all the residents hear the word of the Lord. And what happens when the word is heard? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Somebody has a tongue 
where somebody has a prophetic word. Please, I want you to hold that. I'm almost done, and then I want you to share it. I know that. The Lord just spoke that to me. I believe that faith was running high, and so unlike Nazareth, where Jesus was not able to do that, uh, to do any mighty work there because of their unbelief, unbelief, here many mighty miracles were taking place precisely because there was faith present in the crowd. The city was full of faith as the multitudes were believing. As I say to before, in the kingdom, you cannot see, receive the promises of God without faith. Faith is therefore, in a sense, the currency of the kingdom. While there are some amazing things that can be done when a few of God's people begin to believe, I believe the Bible is teaching us that when the people of God as a whole, when the church begins to believe as a group, that's when we will begin to see the mighty works of God becoming more evident within our midst. I want to encourage each and every one of us not just to be called a believer, but to be a believer. Yes. As we do, we will see the mighty works of God manifest themselves in our midst. And you might say, well, Pastor, why, why do you want to see the mighty works of God manifest? Are you wanting a big ministry? Are you wanting to get on TV? Why is that so important to you? Well, can I just tell you my story? I hurt, and I know what it is to hurt, and I know what it is to have pain, and I know what it is to see that thing consume you to where all you think about is, I can't go over here. Why? I have to take my medicine at 10 o'clock. I can't do this. Why? There's no place for me to sit. and I, I can't sit down for a long time. I can't go over here. Why? Because this is taking place in my life. And I have a very, compared to many people, just a minor condition. Think about people that are suffering with cancer, rheumatoid arthritis. They're paralyzed. They're deaf. They're blind. It doesn't just affect them, it affects their family, it affects their life. To where some people, I would imagine, they think, this is no life. Well, Jesus came that they would have life, and life more abundantly. And he paid a price on the cross so that people could have life. I'm not believing God. I don't care if anybody knows my name. I'm not believing God for me. I'm believing God for the individuals that are hurting. That Jesus wants to heal. Jesus wants to deliver. He wants to set them free. He paid a price for that. He went to a cross that they might be free. It says in Isaiah 53, it says, Surely he carried our sicknesses and he bore our pains. Yet we looked at him and we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for, not his, our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. He paid a price for that and it was a tremendous price because he loves people. For God so loved the world. The enemy comes but to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life. What kind of life? An abundant life. How about the addict that can't seem to get free of his, of his addiction, whether it be alcohol or opioids addiction? That's increasing in this whole country. You know, everywhere people are being addicted to opioids. And that's not a life. And I want to tell you something. It doesn't destroy their lives. It destroys their families. It doesn't just rob them of their income. It robs their families of their income. It robs them of their peace. It robs them of their joy. It robs them of... Jesus didn't come just so somebody can go to heaven. He came that they might have life. We have to understand that. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm glad and I want people to go to heaven. My brother went to heaven and he was saved. I mean, he was, I know he was saved for 90 days. He was without alcohol for 90 days, but alcohol took his life. It took his liver 40 years of his life, empty, gone. I believe, and I want to believe, that even when people are in that condition, if we believe God and see the promises of God manifest, that even someone like that, God can come in and heal their liver, yes. deliver them from their addiction, and they can live life the way God intended them to live. Free, whole, leaping, jumping, and praising God. Who's got that tongue or prophetic word? Don't wait for somebody else.